video for Ethiopia. We will start the interview on Af American policy in general in Africa. It seems in the last year, um, American policy in for the continent of Africa has been a bit discombobulated, and especially since the uh, American withdrawal from Afghanistan in August, and with the amount of coups that took place in Africa, it seems something is off kilter. Can you talk a bit about that and, and what do you think it is? Well, I'm not sure I agree with you. I think the American policy toward Africa has been fairly consistent. Uh, for example, uh, the Trump administration uh, wanted to promote uh, relationships between U.S. business and African business. He called it Prosper Africa. That's right. I think, uh, this is a continuity of previous administrations, starting, I think, with the time when I was assistant secretary, where we decided that what Africa needs more than foreign aid is private investment. And mm -hmm. more important than that are Africans who invest in their own, in their own countries. So uh, President Trump uh, encouraged U.S. investors, and I think President Biden is doing the same thing right now. So what do you attribute all these African coups and, and the problems that are taking place in, in the continent to? Is it, um, you know, besides the fact that, the, the, you know, the Chinese and the Russians are getting involved seriously in the continent, there's something is um, off kilter in terms of what we're seeing. Yes, well, Africa is going through a difficult period because, first of all, there is terrorism in different parts of Africa, in the Sahel region, in the Somali region, in Sudan. Uh, and this is causing a, a great use of resources. And the reason you're seeing, you've been seeing some coups is that the armies of these countries, the Mali, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso, they're saying, we're not getting enough resources. The government wants us to fight these Islamic terrorists, but we don't get the money that we need to fight. So we're going to take over. And we're going to we're going to get the resources and and do the fighting uh, for our people. Okay. Um, if if that's the case, wouldn't our diplomats in the continent have realized that these problems are taking place already and maybe address them before we ended up with what is it now four or five coups in the last few months? Yeah, that's right. Well, the, the Americans, I think, have essentially said in those countries where they're, they're speaking French, we want to see the French government out ahead. And the French have really, they put 5,000 troops into the Sahel and, and they, they are helping to fight the Islamists. So, and the United States has provided uh, technical assistance. We've had 400 troops in the Sahel, not fighters, but uh, providing training and resources. We have a drone base in Agadez in Niger, which mm -hmm. is providing intelligence. So although we want the French uh, to take the lead, uh, which is natural since they're the former colonial power, we want to be helpful, which we're, which we're doing quite now, uh, under starting under the Trump administration, or even before under the Obama administration, continuing now under Biden. Okay, so let's what we'll do is we'll we'll go towards the the horn of africa and the, the area around ethiopia and the horn in general and since you were last involved and you were a very a, a pivotal figure in um, the affairs of the country especially i think maybe now ethiopia since then has doubled in population uh, but you were involved in um, negotiating the peace in ethiopia back in in 1990 the uh, bringing in of the uh, TPLF government, uh, and of course the uh, Eritrean situation and the independence of Eritrea. Um, what do you see that is going on now that you think you may have missed back then and you could have done better back then so that we wouldn't be living the results of today, especially with the conflict that is going on? Well, uh the TPLF, uh, the Tigray and People's Liberation Front, had been in power for 29 years. Mm -hmm. When I negotiated the final peace in 1990, 91, uh, the TPLF had captured uh, Addis Ababa militarily, and they established the first post-war government. And unfortunately, the government that they established 
was not democratic. It was a, a total TPLF dictatorship. They, they created a fake confederation of, of 10 states. Each ethnic group had their own state, and it looked like a decentralized government, but it wasn't. The TPLF totally controlled everything. They controlled all the wealth. Uh, they controlled all the elections. So it was a total uh, TPLF dictatorship. Now, this fell apart in 2019, and uh, what ended up was the, uh, the the new prime minister who had been part of the, uh, the TPLF uh, government, he took power in Addis, and the mm -hmm. TPLF resisted. So now what you're seeing now is the TPLF is trying to remain in power in their home province of Tigray, and the central government under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed does not accept that. They're saying the TPLF should be finished because they were in power for 29 years, amassed great wealth for themselves, and did not do anything for, for the Ethiopian people. So the problem right now is the central government against the TPLF in Tigray, and unfortunately there's a terrible war going on, and a lot of people are dying. And how do you see the American policy when it comes to the situation in Ethiopia? Um, especially because it seems uh, to most people are observing that somehow the American government's policy towards Ethiopia has been tilting towards the TPLF and the goals of bringing them back into power, at least until a few weeks ago or a month ago. Definitely that was the perception that that was going on. Do you see the same thing? I, I've seen those uh, statements by people, and I think there's some, it's fair to say that there's some truth to that because the U.S. has had such good relations uh, with the TPLF over the years. Uh, but, I, but what the American government is saying right now is stop fighting, stop fighting, stop the killing, and concentrate on humanitarian assistance especially for Tigray, where there's a lot of starvation. People are not be able to cultivate the land. Uh, food is not coming in. So the, the whole emphasis of the United States right now is not to be for or against anyone, but just we want peace and we want a negotiation to take place. But if you say negotiations, it means the TPLF and the government will be equal, right? That's, that's right. what negotiation means. And I think this is a mistake. They, they should not consider the TPLF to be the equal of the government. And I think well, that the United I'm States happy. should say the TPLF is finished and they should dissolve. I'm actually happy you brought this up. I'm sorry to have interrupted you for a moment because I will refer to your tweet, uh, which I think was on January 24th, which got a lot of attention, um, that the US should concentrate on persuade, persuading the TPLF that after 29 years in power in Addis, they're rejected by the national population and that peace is possible only after they dissolve their movement and accept amnesty. Um, is that something that you still hold on to and you think that they should be receiving amnesty? I think so. I, I don't think it would make sense to charge them with criminality, although they've done some pretty bad things in terms of stealing the wealth. Uh, the TPLF had a monopoly on trucking they had a monopoly on international commerce. They had a number, had a monopoly in telecommunications. If you go to the city of Adowa in, in, in Tigray, you'll see these gated communities where TPLF cadres are living in very in luxurious terms. So I think they have not done anything for the people of Ethiopia, but they've done a lot for the TPLF. I think it's time, their time is finished and it's time for them to leave the scene and allow the people of, of Ethiopia to choose. And I remember that in 1995, they had an election in which the TPLF lost in the city of Ethiopia. Well, they didn't cancel the election. They said, oh, we can't lose. You see. So I think the TPLF is no longer relevant for the, for the state of Ethiopia, and they should be, should be leaving. Okay. Now, having said that, and at the same time with the signals that the American government was giving out to let's consider a little bit what happened um, recently where you had um, 
somehow signals here in the United States and at, uh, at the State Department, and I don't mean to be uh, pointing fingers, but it seems that they missed some signals of what was going on in the continent there, or in, in the horn there, because at one point in time during all of this, you had Turkey, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Iran, Israel, all on the same side of the government of Ethiopia trying to turn the tide around against the DPLF. Yet it seemed that the US government here was still adamant on sort of helping the TPLF government there or the, the TPLF group um, sort of overcome the situation. What do you think happened here where we missed those signals, where we had Israel, the United States, I mean, Israel, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and others, all on, and Iran, all on the same side and actually supplying arms to the Ethiopian government, while here in Washington, it seems like even with the, uh, you know, we're, we're passing all kinds of uh, uh, resolutions, etc., against the Ethiopian government, putting uh, all kinds of problems, removing them from Agoa, etc., where was this miss? What happened here? Well, I, I haven't, sp I must admit, I haven't spoken to State Department people about it, but I think they had a historic connection to the TPLF, which was very friendly, especially during the time of Mela Zanawi. Mm -hmm. oh, he, was, uh, he was prime minister. They were very close to him. And I think this, this trend that the TPLF is legitimate uh, rulers of Ethiopia, that continued over time. But when their rule fell apart in 2019, the State Department tended to look at the situation as TPLF government, and they were equal. And when they were equal, that when they considered them equal, it meant that the TPLF was considered on the same status as the government, which was a big mistake. The whole, as you say, the whole, virtually the entire international community recognized the government in Addis Ababa and uh, were supporting the government in Addis Ababa. And I would say that the State Department was a, a victim of history. They were so close to the TPLF over the many, many years in power that they failed to see that the time of the TPLF is over and that there was a new regime in power. Also, I must say that some people in the State Department were saying, well, the, the regime in Addis is not really representative of, of the whole country. It's really a return of Amhara hegemony which was true on the emperors and that sort of thing. So I think it was a mistake of analysis on the part of the State Department. Well put. Um, if, let's just look at Ethiopia in terms of the stability of the Horn, the stability of the Red Sea area and the Middle East, uh, especially with the GERD and the water issue with Egypt and Sudan. Where do you think things are heading in, in, that, in that direction? And where do you see the United States government standing when it comes to those issues? Because obviously also those issues, whether it is the uh, peace in the Middle East, the situation with Yemen, Red Sea security, water, and the GERD issue has definitely contributed to the civil war that is happening in Ethiopia now. How do you see the next few months or a year, and where do you see the American position in order to uh, reduce some of these tensions and at the same time accept the fact that this is a pivotal part of the world and, and a, a, a pivotal part of the peace uh, calculus that has to take place in the Middle East. Well, I would say there must be a connection between the great Renaissance Dam that the Ethiopians have built and, and what's happening now in Tigray. I, I, I do not have actual facts, but I do not doubt that the TPLF is receiving assistance from those who are worried about the dam and how it impact on them, that is Sudan and, and Egypt. And so I think that the, the Renaissance Dam is a, is a key factor in stability in, in the region. And uh, the problem with the Renaissance Dam is not that the Ethiopians want the water, they're not using any of the water that's coming in the uh, in the Blue Nile. They're sending it right through to the Blue Nile to the north. What they're doing is using the electricity, which is fine. However, the question is, how long will it take to fill the dam? 
And if they fill the dam too quickly, that means for, for the farming period, Egypt and Sudan will be de deprived of much of their water. And this is the problem, how to convince the Ethiopians to slow down the filling of the dam. Let's say instead of filling it in four years or six years, fill it in 11 years. And that, and in fact, that's what was done in the Aswan Dam. With that mm -hmm. mission. So it's, it's a question of uh, relations between these governments and Ethiopia on the question of the dam. And I think the Ethiopians should accept to fill it more slowly. And in return for that, the international community could help them in the interim period with uh, other types of electric power, with uh, fossil fuel electric power while they're waiting for the big dam to, to, to fill up. I think there is a solution, but instead of cooperating, the Addis government has been saying, we don't care about you, we'll fill the dam and, and it's your problem on the other end. <laughs> okay. I you know, the, the issue, the issue, though, is and I know you've been involved in, in, in power Africa and you're very aware of power in the continent um, and, and, and um, how these issues um, uh, need to be worked out. Do you really think that that's the position of the Ethiopian government or do you feel that there's uh, a little bit also on the Egyptian side, a little um, inflexibility in terms of how you know, th th there's a sensitivity when it comes to uh, water that affects Egypt because of the fact that they're completely dependent on it and there's a political component to this. Yes, well, I sympathize with the Egyptians here. You know, this is vital for them. And I, I think if uh, they get, say, 30% less water in any year, it's going to be a big trouble politically and uh, economically for Egypt. So I feel Egypt has a good case. Uh, in their argument. And there are solutions, as I said, uh, they interim in the interim period, if they fill the dam slowly, quickly we can have other forms of electricity to help fulfill the Ethiopian government need for more development, more more manufacturing, more more power. They need it, that's true. But there are solutions. And instead of just saying, well, we're gonna we're gonna fill the dam willy-nilly. I don't think that, that that's very good. Okay. Let's change a little bit the subject and look at um, Turkish, Russian, and Chinese influence in the region, especially Chinese and Russian influence in the region. Um, lately, uh, you know, the, Rus the Russians have been definitely asserting their muscle, in, uh, flexing their muscle in Africa, uh, whether it is in the Sahel or Central Africa, other places, it looks like they are also in negotiations in uh, West and Central Africa and definitely also in East Africa, in Ethiopia and Sudan. And at the same time, of course, we're aware of what the Chinese are doing and have been doing and how engaged they've been. What do you feel the United States government should be doing in order to alleviate or at least turn this tide and, and change it so that the United States government can also be assertive and lean forward towards these countries and also um, reduce some of these influences. Well, uh, to take Russia first, Russia has only one thing to offer. Russia can only offer military, either to send mercenary troops called the Wagner Group or to send arms. They have no capability of doing economic development. But Russia, the whole Russian economy is the same size as Italy, even though Russia has four times the population of Italy. It's not an economic power. So they cannot help Africa in, in economic development. All they can do is, is send troops or send arms. And this is not good for Africa because once the Russians get involved, they start stealing resources. For example, look at Central African Republic has wonderful gem diamonds mm -hmm. and having internal problems and the government called upon the Russians to help them. They sent mercenaries and now it's the Russians who have the diamonds. And, and it's true in many countries. The Russians will put in mercenaries who quickly get involved in natural resources. Basically, they're not offering anything uh, to the Africans. And we should just tell the Africans, look, don't get involved with the Russians. It's not to your benefit. 
there, there's the United Nations, peacekeeping. There are all sorts of ways of getting assistance, but don't deal with the Russians. And when it comes to the Chinese? Well, the Chinese are different. The Chinese became interested in Africa, I would say, about uh, 25 years ago because of their great economic expansion. Unlike the Russians, who are economically moribund, the Chinese had a great economic expansion, and they had a great need for commodities. And the commodities were in Africa. So they set up a system of what I would call a barter system. They said to Africa, you give us a, a regular supply of these commodities, and in return, we will help you build infrastructure with Chinese companies. And, it, and it's been a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, process. Uh, for example, they'll say to a country, guarantee us 100,000 barrels of oil per day, and we will, we will build infrastructure for you. It's an exchange, and I think in general, it's worked pretty well. It's worked pretty, they've had problems. First of all, the Chinese wanted to send all the workers from China. Mm -hmm. So you, you, I saw them in, in various airports in Europe with their red hats and that sort of thing, going to, going to Africa. And the Africans said, no, this is no good. You need to have African workers. So more and more of the African countries said, you can have Chinese workers, but only 10%. The rest, you have to train Africans. And the Chinese have agreed to that for the most part. Secondly, there's the question of how do you treat African workers? Mm -hmm. When I was teaching at the university, I had a, a student who went to Africa to look at how the China, what the Chinese are doing, went to a, an investment and saw that the workers were being treated very badly. You know, no bathroom breaks, uh, not allowed to eat lunch, that sort of thing. <laughs> and she said, why are you treating them so like that? She said, well, we treat them like we treat Chinese workers at home. <laughs> I've seen that too. But in, in, in general, the Chinese, uh, what the Chinese have been doing has been fairly positive, I would say, for the Africans because they have gotten roads, they have gotten electric power and various things. It hasn't always been perfect because the various Chinese companies, government-owned companies, are of different quality. For example, in the Congo, the road between Kinshasa and the port of Matadi, which is their yes. big export-import, it's about, uh, it used to be, when the Congolese maintained it, it used to be a six-hour drive. After the Chinese came in, they paved the road, and it became a two-and-a-half, three-hour drive. But the, the construction was kind of shoddy, and under the tropical weather, it washed out after three years. So it's a mixed bag, and my, my advice to the, to the Africans, you have to manage the Chinese. Uh, make sure they do everything right, uh, that they don't bring in too many workers. Also, there's another problem. Uh, when the Chinese workers are finished with the project, a lot of them tend not to go home. They go into the countryside, they establish retail, and they import Chinese goods. That's right. So that causes problems. Uh, go to the city of Kano in northern Nigeria. It used to be a big hub of trade and investment and manufacturing. Well, Chinese came in there and established retail and just imported everything and undercut everything in Kano. So Kano is more or less of a dead city now because of that. So I'm telling the Africans, you manage the Chinese, make sure they do what's right and don't let them get away with all sorts of things that are, are not good for you. Excellent. Well, this brings me to my next point of, or before last point, and that is the um, the speech that Prime Minister Abi gave um, at the African Union in, on February 5th. And in that speech, amongst the many things that he touched upon, is also the veto power for an Africa seat at the, at the, um, at, at the United Nations and uh, at the Security Council. Um, this has been brought up again, and it looks like both China and Russia are supportive of this, and other African countries are definitely supportive of this. What do you think of this initiative? Well, I think, uh, well, I think about 20 years ago, there used to be only one African seat on the Security Council. That's right. Yeah, the Africans themselves decided uh, every, three, every three years 
which country will send a delegate to the Security Council. Well, about 20 years ago, they said the UN Security Council members said that Africans deserve three seats because of their population and because of all the things that are going on. So Africa now has three seats and each, each seat serves for three years. And it's the African Union who decides which countries, and it's a rotating thing. And every country, every country has to have one turn before any other country could have two turns. And I think, and I think it's, it's working out very well. But the question is, should the Africans have a veto power? Well, the, the original UN Charter gave the veto power to the great powers, uh, China, Russia, the United States, UK, and France. And I don't think they're going to allow anybody else to, to have that veto power. It's clear that they're going to resist it. If you have a Chinese, if you have an African veto power, why not have a South American veto power, you see? So it's not going to happen and they should forget about it, but they should be happy with the fact that they do vote. They have three votes, which is important. And I remember when we were uh, working on uh, the, the question of, uh, let me see, I, I remember several questions where the United States won the day in the Security Council with African vote help. And of course. Very grateful for, for that. So they have power. The three votes have power, although not veto power. Last question, and that brings us back to the Ethiopian situation and the Ethiopian that you and I both live here in Washington, D.C. Um, th there is a big Ethiopian diaspora here in the United States. Um, in the Ethiopian community and even in Virginia lately, um, after uh, Governor Yunkin was uh, voted into power, there was a lot of talk about the fact that uh, had it not been for some of the immigrant communities and especially the Ethiopian community who had um, voted for, uh, for Governor Yunkin because of the disappointment towards about policy towards Ethiopia by the uh, Democrats and by the Biden government, uh, that he wouldn't be in power, that it definitely helped or aided in pushing him forward. Taking that into consideration and, and projecting that towards the future, especially when it comes to American policy um, towards Ethiopia and uh, how do you see this sort of trend or how do you see this um, developing? Well, I think uh, it's quite normal for the diaspora to, uh, to express its views and to vote according to what they think is happening in their, in their former country. And the Ethiopian diaspora is very active in, uh, in expressing their view. And I, it's my view that the majority of the diaspora favor the government in, in power in Addis and do not favor the TPLF. Uh, in fact, I've had TPLF people contract, contact, people in the diaspora contact me and said, oh, well, we've got to support TPLF, but they're in a distinct minority <laughs> and they uh, and they want to support the government. That, and I think the U.S. government is reacting to that slowly, that, that they, they must support the, the government control over the whole country and not, not consider the TPLF to be an equal an equal partner. And of course, what the Eritreans are doing, uh, the, the diaspora favors that. And in fact, uh, sometimes when I take a taxi and there's an Eritrean, there's an Eritrean driver, they say, oh, Mr. Cohen, we, we know your politics, you ride without paying. <laughs> but when I get a TPLF driver, he gives me a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> the Ethiopian diaspora is like all the others. Uh, there's, the, there's the Jewish diaspora, there is the Irish. Uh, I remember once uh, I was talking to the governor of New Jersey during the Irish Civil War. Mm -hmm. I said, are you having a lot of trouble with, uh, with Jewish people putting pressure on you to support Israel? He says, yeah, not so much. You should see the Irish. <laughs> They are the worst, he says, because they want us to support the, the Irish Republican Army, you see. That's so amazing. The diaspora getting involved in foreign policy is quite normal in the United States. Well, 
last but not least, there's two things I wanted to talk about, but I, I will, we will leave Eritrea for another time. But what I wanted to ask you is, um, what do you have to say to the Ethiopian government now that you know we, we are talking on Ethiopian TV um, in terms of what they can do to ameliorate the relationship with the United States government, or at least ameliorate what seems to have been a down point in the last few months during the war in order to move into a positive direction to uh, repair the damage and uh, you know a better future? I think they have to demonstrate that the they want peace, they want the end to the fighting, even though they know the war is not over yet. They have to demonstrate to the United States that peace is utmost in their uh, in their thinking, and even more important, that they they want to allow humanitarian assistance to go to the starving people of Tigray, because one of the big problems in Tigray has been kind of a blockade. They're not allowing humanitarian aid to go through, except in small amounts. So, priority number one with the U.S. We are going to open up to all humanitarian aid going into Tigray. And that the United States is considers priority number one. And secondly, we do want to have peace. How can you help us, the United States? Do you want to be a mediator? Please come in and help us. Okay. And, and the United States will be very happy. Well, with that, we will end today's interview. Ambassador Cohen, thank you so much for your time. And thank you uh, for your opinions. And we will be in touch with you again. Thank you very much and have a good day. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you.